Hello, and welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. We're so glad you're joining with us this week. Before we get into the message today, some announcements of things that are upcoming and happening soon that we want you to know about. Uh, for our ladies, we are just a few weeks out from ladies' retreat, so if you have not yet registered, please make sure to do so. Our men just had their retreat a few weeks back, and it was an incredibly impactful and powerful weekend away. So we want to encourage all of the women and ladies in our church as well to get signed up for their retreat as we are believing for the same experience at Women's Retreat this year. Uh, also, for our kids, we have a bunch of things happening this summer. Uh, in-person VBS is back at the church uh, during the third week of July. So if you want to get your kids signed up for that, please do so. The registration form is available on our church website and in the church Facebook group. Also, we are in need of volunteers for our week of VBS as well. So if you are looking for something to do this summer, want to be involved in our VBS to work with our kids and to serve our church, make sure to register for that as well. Uh, the sign up for that same places, church website, and the church Facebook page. There will be uh, an in-person training session as well for Summer VBS for all volunteers coming up in June. More details for that coming soon. And then we are also incredibly excited to announce that in-person camps are back for both kids and and youth kids camp registration is open right now, so make sure you get registered for kids camp. Youth camp registration is coming up soon. And while we're on the topic of camps, I just want to talk a little bit about this. Uh, we believe very strongly in camps here at Central Hills Four Square Church. It is something that uh, has impacted a number of us over the the last number of years. I know for myself, uh, I made a decision for Jesus at kids camp. I made a decision, uh, or I, I, I sought, sought the Lord and the release of the Holy Spirit in my life at youth camp. I felt the call uh, to become a youth pastor at youth camp. Uh, camp really shaped me during my formative years. And then as a youth pastor, I have testimony after testimony of teenagers whose lives were just incredibly changed at youth camp. Uh, you know, I look at our staff. I look to Danny Hunt and Matthew and Victoria. These are all young people who can attest to the power of what God did in their lives and camp experiences. And we are so excited for the chance for our kids and for our teenagers to once again be able to go away to Stillwood at the end of August and be involved in camp and to have that same opportunity to just set aside time and to have God speak to them and do a miraculous and wonderful work in their lives. But what we need to know for this year is that over the last couple of years of COVID uh, and with the, with the inflation of the, and the cost of living, the price of camp has gone up substantially. Uh, if you remember pre-COVID, if you had kids in camp pre-COVID, you're looking at like 350 to 400 for a week of camp. Uh, this year, kids camp is going to sit at about 465, 485 for our kids, and for our teenagers, it's up to 540 dollars. I'm going to let that sticker shock set in for a second. But the, the, the fact of the matter is that is the price. We can't do much about it. Other than this, we can give towards camp and we can support our students and our kids in their fundraisers because we value camp experience. We know that it's important for the life of our kids. So we've often talked about investing in the lives of our students. Camp is a great way to invest in, our, in the lives of our students. We're not just giving money to send them away for a fun week and to get them out of the house. We are investing in their spiritual growth and development. We are investing in their spiritual future. We are saying that we believe that God moves powerfully in these venues. We want our kids, our children, our teenagers to have the opportunity. So we are going to invest in making that a reality for them. So over these next number of weeks during the remainder of the month of May, we will be uh, encouraging our church to give towards camp. If you would like to give in any way, shape, or form to help, or it's helping our kids and our students and our teenagers get to camp, just write camp on your giving envelope or in your e-transfer. Uh, money given towards camp will be uh, designated by Matthew and Victoria and myself towards who needs it and what camps it goes towards. If you're looking to maybe, maybe you just want to sponsor a kid, maybe you just want to just call up the church office and say, I just want to sponsor a kid, or I want to sponsor three students. We would love to have people sponsor uh, full camp packages for, for teenagers and for kids, or maybe you just want to give uh, a monetary amount towards it. We want to encourage you in these coming weeks to prayerfully consider how you can give and invest in the lives of our kids and teenagers so that they can be at camp this year and experience all that God has in store for them. So I'll be talking more about that as we go, but I just want to encourage you to give towards camp. Uh, I know that God's going to move in a miraculous way with our students this year. All right, those are the announcements, and I'll be back in a moment for week two of our series in the book of Revelation.
Well, good day, church. Welcome back to our series in the book of Revelation entitled Victorious. Now, quick review for those of us maybe joining us for the first time, or if you missed last week, or if you just need a refresher, we are going to camp out in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 for the next number of weeks, paying specific attention to the letters sent by Jesus through John to the seven churches in Asia. You might ask yourself, well, you know, why would we do this? Like, we're not one of the seven churches in Asia. But here's the thing. These seven churches existed in time and space, but they are also archetypes. They are examples of the church we could become or perhaps have become. And depending on the letter, that's either a good thing or a bad thing. So the main question we seek to answer in this series is simply this. Jesus, what are you speaking to us, your church, today? Now, the image used in Revelation for the church is one of a lampstand. We saw that back in chapter 1. It says, I saw seven golden lampstands in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, that being Jesus. As for the mystery of the seven golden lampstands, they, the lampstands, are the seven churches. It's a simple yet powerful image. These physical churches are places, they are locations where the light of Jesus is shown. They themselves are not the light. Rather, they, they hold the light. We, the church, have been entrusted to show Jesus and the light that he is. We are not the focus. He is. And I love what Eugene Peterson says about this imagery of the lampstand in his work on the book of Revelation. He says, Dirty lampstands do not extinguish Christ's light. Polished gold does not outshine Christ's light. Of course, it is better that it, by, that it be neither of these things, neither tarnished out of neglect or polished in vanity. It is better that it simply be there, unselfconsciously and inconspicuously receiving and sharing the light of Christ. So as we go through these letters, it is key for us to keep in mind that a victorious church is one that shines the light of Jesus. Victorious church is one that hears both the encouraging words of Jesus and the correctional words of Jesus. And then is able to discern and put into practice what is being said. There's a reason why each letter ends the same way. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Church, we need to hear what the Spirit is speaking to us. What must we do to shine his light as bright as possible? What must we do to be victorious? Let's pray. God, we ask as we turn in your word today, once again to the book of Revelation, to a section that is uh, often avoided or often misinterpreted. God, we pray that you can speak very clearly and very powerfully to us as we begin to look at these letters to these churches. And today as we look at the first letter, God, would you just reveal to us Um, where we have followed in their footsteps, where we have not, um, what we need to do to perhaps address any issues we may have in our own lives and life of our church. God, would you speak clearly to us, and may we have ears to hear what the Spirit is speaking. In the name of Jesus, amen. So today we're looking at the letter to the church in Ephesus. And since these are all actual historical churches, some historical context will serve us well. So we're going to set the stage, then we'll read the text. Ephesus is the greatest commercial city in Asia Minor at this point in history. It was a major financial center. It hosted the Pan-Ionian Games, which at that point in history were second only to the Olympic Games. It was renowned as the home of worship to the goddess Artemis. In fact, her temple was in Ephesus and was one of the seven wonders of the world. And in the center of business and politics and religious pluralism emerged one of the most influential churches in the history of Christianity. By the time of Revelation, Ephesus had become the center of the Christian movement. And if you, if you look at the history and the spiritual heritage, what a church this was. The church of Ephesus was founded by the Apostle Paul. It was nurtured by Priscilla and Aquila and Timothy, major names in the early church. It was at this point in time pastored by the Apostle John, and it was home to Mary, the mother of Jesus. I mean, I guess for a second I have to wonder, like, if I was, how do you pastor 
a church where the mother of Jesus is sitting there in the front row. Like, that's just incredible. This was the church of the ancient world, hugely influential, the kind of church people would run to in order to learn how to do church effectively and successfully. So with that in mind, with that image of this church in mind, here's the message that Jesus gives John to deliver. Starting in Re- Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. It says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So to this massively important and influential church, Jesus appropriately commends them for all of their good, kingdom-minded work. But... And this is huge. Jesus holds one thing against the Ephesian church. And this one thing is so important, it effectively negates all of the good they're doing. In fact, Jesus says, if you don't address this one thing, I will come and remove your lampstand. That is effectively him saying, I will close your church. I will see that you no longer have a place of influence. You need to get this one thing right. Wow, what, what an incredibly just weighty statement. Do you think Jesus has their attention now? Does Jesus have your attention now? There's one more note of context I want to just fill in because I never want unfamiliar words or unfamiliar images to trip us up or distract us from the main point. So we read this one line in here that says, The practices of the Nicolaitans. Uh, we, we, it's mentioned here, and we're going to read about this same group again later on in the, chur- in the letter to the church in Pergamum. Now, there are a variety of ideas as to who they are and what they taught, and we're going to look at that a little bit later on in a different message. For now, the important piece, piece is simply this. The Ephesian church held to the orthodox teachings of Jesus and the church. The Nicolaitans did not. That's basically the context we need for this message today. So let's get into this. What is the church in Ephesus doing well? And what is the one thing that Jesus holds against them? And what does this mean for us, both as individuals and as a church here at Sunshine Hills today? So Jesus highlights five things this church is to be commended for. He says, your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance, you cannot tolerate wicked people, and you test those who claim to be apostles. Now, if this highly influential church is being commended for these things, should we be doing the same things? Well, let's take a look at each and see. So the first one, your deeds. This is a church buzzing with activity. The people are engaged. This is not a church that people are attending to be comfortably entertained. This is a church where all the members are actively involved. Everyone working together for the advancement of God's kingdom. The people get it. They, there is buy-in. This is every pastor, this is every leader's dream church. Second thing, it says your deeds, then it says your hard work. The church is committed to the mission. They are willing to pay the price. They are pushing themselves for the kingdom. The word used here, hard work, it speaks of strenuous and exhausting labor. They're not, they're not just doing a little to get by. They are, they are committing themselves to the hard work of the kingdom. They're giving all they have for the sake of the gospel. The church has counted the cost and decided that it is more than worth it. So your deeds, your hard work. Then the third thing, your perseverance. Now, perseverance speaks to that inner attitude of long-suffering, the 
patient endurance of hardship. If you remember, the Ephesian church faced strong and relentless opposition. They were constantly resisting the pressure of the Roman emperor cult. We talked about that last week in regards to why John was on Patmos receiving this revelation in the first place. Because at this point in history, the the church was under significant pressure to bow to the Roman emperor, to bow their knee to Caesar and to pledge allegiance to him to uh, recognize him as Lord and God, which they weren't, weren't going to do because Jesus is Lord and God. They also had to refuse the participation in the idolatrous worship of Artemis that had consumed the culture around them. And because of this, they would have endured the loss of friends, the loss of customers. Their businesses probably would have been boycotted by the local community. They would have been scorned by local leaders. Yet in the midst of all this hardship, they remained steadfast in their faith. And the most incredible line where Jesus says, they have not grown weary. Through all of this hardship and all the perseverance and endurance, they have not grown weary. It hasn't tired them out. They are still strong and vibrant. It's an incredible picture. So their deeds, their hard work, their perseverance. The fourth is this. It says they cannot tolerate wicked people. Now, taken at face value, that might seem pretty harsh. Let's unpack that. They were a church committed to holy living and right teaching, or we use the words doctrine or or orthodoxy. Holy living and right teaching. Now, for context, Paul spent nearly three years of his ministry with the church in Ephesus. It was the longest he stayed in any one place during his ministry in the book of Acts. Three years with the church in Ephesus. And in Acts chapter 20, we read Paul's emotional farewell to the leaders of this church. Now, this would have been years before um, this letter to the Ephesians now, because at this point, Paul would have been leaving the church uh, in Acts 20, leaving it in the care of, of Timothy and John. It would have been years before he took over. So this was, was back in the day. But in Acts chapter 20, we read this emotional farewell. Paul says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw every uh, draw away disciples after them. Paul leaves this charge, this warning of what might happen if they're not careful. So we need to take note when Jesus commends the church saying, you know, I'm commanding you, you cannot tolerate wicked people. Jesus is not saying, hey, great job for having no grace or love for sinners. That's not what he's saying. He's not commending them for being exclusive and having no grace and love for people. What he is saying is he's acknowledging that the leaders of the church, as it's passed from leader to leader, they have kept and fulfilled the charge that Paul left them with. That they have successfully, over the years, watched over the people and pastored that church well. That they have not compromised in matters of morality or ethics, and they have guarded the church against unholy or ungodly ways of thinking and acting. You know, we don't, we don't want to take this as this uh, exclusive, we have no love or grace for, for sinners. It was much more of a picture of their caring, protection, and love for the people they were left in, in charge of and for, for managing that church community well. And then continuing in the same vein, it comes to the fifth thing they're commanded for. It says, you test those who claim to be apostles but are not. In other words, when someone rolled into Ephesus and claimed to be an apostle of Jesus, Jesus with some new enlightened teaching, they didn't immediately invite those people to come preach on Sunday morning. They, they are a discerning congregation that knows what truth looks like and knows what truth doesn't look like. They were unwilling to settle for the feel-good theologies of the day. Now, by all outward appearances, this was a solid church that worked hard, that had great outreach, that endured through difficult times and protected the integrity of the gospel message. When we think of that, they are a shining example to follow. I guess let's ask, let's ask ourselves these questions. Do we want to be known here at Sunshine Hills as a church that is engaged and active, not just coming on a Sunday to be entertained? The answer, I hope, is yes. Do we want to be known as a church that works hard and is committed to the mission of Jesus? Yes. 
Do we want to be known as a church that perseveres, endures hardship, stays the course, and through it all does not grow weary in following Jesus? Yes. Do we want to be known as a church that cares for its people and is committed to holy living and right teaching? Yes. Do we want to be known as a church that has a discerning mind that knows truth and holds to it? Yes. These are qualities that we should be pursuing in our own lives and in the life of our church. Jesus commends the church in Ephesus for creating this type of culture. However, however, Jesus isn't finished speaking. In the next line, he says, Yet I hold this against you. Yet I hold this against you. It's an incredibly sobering statement. In essence, Jesus is saying, I know all the good you're doing. I see it all. But there's still an issue we need to talk about. All of the good you're doing does not cancel out the bad that I see. In fact, if you can't address this concern, if you can't acknowledge it, if you can't fix it, you're going to negate all of the good that you are doing. That's tough. This must be a real big issue, a real big concern. So what is it? Jesus says, you have forsaken the love you had at first. You have left, you have abandoned your first love. Now, first love is a funny thing, especially when it comes to romantic relationships. You you go out of your way to spend as much time as humanly possible with the one you love. You, you know, you'll basically do anything for them, not because you feel you have to, but because, because you just really want to. You know, I remember when Eric and I were first dating. I'm not, I'm not joking at all. We saw each other every single day. Uh, I don't want to, like, misquote this, but I'm pretty sure we saw each other every single day from the moment we started dating to the moment we got married. And then, of course, then we're married and live together, and, it, it, you know, there's been... A few times we've been apart, but we, we see each other like every single day. And it was like, like for sure early on. We never wanted to be apart from one another. Sometimes that even meant squeezing in time when there was no time. Uh, at that, in, in those early days of dating Erica, I lived in Burnaby. I worked at the, the public library. And if, if I'd, be off, I'd, be, uh, I'd be off work at 9 o'clock if I worked the late shift. And if I hadn't seen Erica yet that day, I would jump in my car. I would drive 30 minutes to her house in Surrey. I'd spend a couple hours with her late at night and then drive back home trying not to fall asleep so I could be in bed by hopefully midnight-ish, wake up the next day, and then probably do the same thing all over again. We just, we just desperately wanted to be together all of the time. I'd bring her gifts because, you know, that's what you do when you're young and in love. And I'd find, I found out that her favorite flowers were Gerber daisies, so I just bought a ton of those all the time whenever I felt like it. Didn't need a special day at that point. It was like, hey, I found flowers today. Here you go. I even, I even bought her coffee mugs with Gerber daisies on them because that seemed like a fitting a thing. It was like, you love coffee and Gerber daisies, so I found these mugs that have both. Enjoy. You know, and speaking of coffee... This may, this may shock some people, but up until meeting Erica, I didn't really care for coffee. It wasn't like a thing that I drank. But because I loved her so very much, <laughs> I gave my very best effort early on. And whether I just beat out of my body the distaste for it or whether I just actually grew to love it, I really I like coffee a lot now, and I drink it an awful lot. I remember this one time early on in dating. We were like Taylor for the whole day. And uh, because we were together the, the whole day and because she loved coffee, we stopped at Starbucks like two or three times. And I was still early on my whole like coffee thing. So I wasn't really like acclimated to like the strong stuff. So she's like, maybe you should just have this like really sweet Frappuccino. And at that point it was the, it was the raspberry mocha chip Frappuccino. I think in the course of that day, I downed like two or three of like the big ones of those. And if you're not used, used to like major caffeine and sugar intake, like your body's not ready for that. And I, I drank way too much raspberry mocha chip that one day. But because I loved Erica so much, like I guess I'd do anything. I'd, just, I'd drink large amounts of caffeine and sugar when I shouldn't have. And of course, like, like all young fools in love, we did that obnoxiously cute thing where we'd call each other before going to sleep and refuse to hang up first. You know, what if we just, what if we just fell asleep on the phone while we're still talking to each other? That would be like, it'd be so romantic, right? And you're like, why, why do you share all this? We don't need <laughs> these intimate details of your, your dating life. 
I share it because of this. I still love Erica with all of my heart. We've grown together. We've faced hardship together. We've adventured together. And the love that we have today is all the richer and deeper because of the life that we've lived together. I have immense affection for her. She's my wife, and I love her more than anything. But life is also hard, and life is full of distractions. And there comes a point where the things we did at first don't come as easy. Without the proper attention given, first love can fade as life progresses. The longer you're in a relationship, the more you have to be purposeful to do those things you did at first, the more you have to carve out time. And if you're not careful in any relationship, you can fall into the trap of just checking off the, the assumed relationship boxes, but forgetting how to actually love the other person. And with this term that we read here, first love, Jesus is referring to exclusive love that has first place in our hearts above all else. For all their hard work, patient endurance, and sound doctrine, the Ephesian church was no longer in love with Jesus. Somewhere along the way of doing all the right things, they forgot to love him. They walked away from simple devotion to him. They became busy with the work of doing, doing church, and to their credit, doing it well. But they walked away from their first love. They abandoned their first love. Affection and intimacy were gone. First love is a love that always has time for the beloved. You know, even if I only had like a couple hours to get over to Erica's house, like I'd make that work because first love just always has time for the beloved. First love is attentive and eager. It seeks to please and it's extravagant. Does this describe your relationship with Jesus? Does this sound like the culture of our church here at Sunshine Hills? Or in all of your and our religious doing, have you, have we forgotten how to love Jesus? You know, we can't avoid these hard questions because at the end of the day, all the good we do, all the Christian church boxes that we check off, they mean nothing if we leave behind our first love. Cultivating an intimate, loving relationship with Jesus must be our number one priority. So what do we do? If we find ourselves or our church guilty of the Ephesus problem, what do we do? Thankfully, Jesus spells it out very clearly in his letter to the church. He says, consider or remember how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. He just lays it out. There's three steps. Remember, repent, and redo. First, remember. Consider how far you have fallen. Remember where the love once was. Remember how the love once was. It's the picture I have in my head, and it's often used in like, like montages in, in movies or TV shows. It's that image of like two young lovers, head over heels in love, dancing through the fields together, and then it, it flash forwards like 20 years later, and they're, they're not even sharing the same bed anymore, and they're basically living two separate lives and never, never communicating or being together. Consider the height from which you have fallen. Remember what it looked like at first and look at what it looks like now. Consider the height from which you have fallen. Recognize your condition. Confess that the love is gone, that it's been abandoned. And this first step, this step of remembering, it's not about beating yourself up. It's not about working yourself into some emotional state. Oh God, I'm so sorry that I... It's just a simple acknowledgement of the place you're in and your desire to see it change. God, I, re I remember what it was like at first. And man, man, I've really fallen away from that. And I want to change that. That's that first step. The second is to repent. Now, we use this word often in the context of church, and when we use words often, we often lose sight of their meaning. Repent means to turn around 180 degrees. Stop going down the path you're on and head back to where you need to be. Repentance is a radical U-turn. It's an urgent appeal for instant change. And in the context of a once loving relationship, repentance turning involves changing schedules, changing habits, changing commitments in order to restore intimacy. You can't just 
desire change to happen, you have to do the work to actually make it happen. And the third thing is this, redo. Start doing the things you did at first. Return to the practices and habits that define the time when you first fell in love with Jesus. Hear, hear the call of your first love. You used to listen for my voice. You used to take time to be still before me to seek my face and enjoy my company. You used to open yourself up to my word daily. Nothing got in your way. You used to, to not complicate my commandments. You took them at face value and found freedom in obeying them. You used to weep for those who do not know me. You used to realize you cannot make it on your own and throw yourself on me with reckless abandon. This is the voice of our loving God towards those of us who have abandoned or forsaken our first love. Church, we need to stop being religiously busy for our first love and restart being relationally present with our first love. Do the things you did at first. Go back to the start. But what if I, what if I don't have a first love experience with Jesus? You know, I followed him for years and believe he's my Lord and Savior, but, but I, don't, I don't have things that I did at first. I don't, I don't remember the butterflies in my stomach. I don't remember reckless abandon. I have a difficult question to ask us that I'd like us to consider. Is it possible that you believe in Jesus, that you follow him, that you have faith in him, but that you've never actually been in love with Jesus? By the same token, is it possible that there are churches that believe in Jesus, that follow Jesus, that have faith in Jesus, but have never actually fallen in love with Jesus. More than anything else, we are called to love Jesus. We have been invited into an intimate relationship with him. So if we're looking to develop this intimate relationship with Jesus, what defines these works of first love? The words that come to mind for me are attention, does he have our attention? Affection? Does Jesus have our affection? And passion? Does he have our, our passion? And it's the simple practices. And if you've been in church any length of time, you've heard myself or someone just drill this over and over again. It's the simple practices. Spend time in his word. Spend time in prayer. Talk to him. Get together with other Christians. Tell people about Jesus. It's back to the basics. It's simple devotion. It's returning to Jesus. And then consider the following. Satan does a masterful job in creating a sense of general dissatisfaction with these first works. Christians will run after almost every new strange method or program for growth and stability, especially in the Church of North America, especially here. One thing I've noticed here in North America, North American Christianity, we love self-help spirituality way more than we love biblical Christianity. You know, we don't have the patience for the simple, often mundane first works. We'll do almost anything except the first works. But a commitment to the first works, a commitment to the Word of God, a commitment to prayer, a commitment to gathering together, a commitment to telling people about Jesus, a commitment to these first works results in the cultivation of a passionate and intimate love with Jesus. So as we come to a close, I want to revisit our opening questions. What must we do to shine his light as bright as possible? What must we do to be victorious? The answer to both is found in rediscovering our first love, Jesus Christ. Where simple love for Jesus goes, so does the light. Think about this. Without first love, service becomes lifeless routine. Without first love, endurance becomes joyless and tiring. Without first love, orthodoxy becomes narrow-minded, nitpicking legalism. Without first love, hatred of the practices 
of the Nicolaitans becomes hatred of the Nicolaitans themselves. To abandon our first love as a church is to negate all the good we do, no matter how good it is. But when we return to our first love and we root all that we do in a deep, affectionate love for Jesus, our light will shine brighter than the noonday sun. And then at the very end of the letter, there is a promise to the individual who is victorious, meaning to the one who is able to figure out this first love stuff, to the one who commits to the first works, to the one who has fallen in love with Jesus. It says, you will have the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This image is an obvious callback to the Garden of Eden. Taken at face value, it's, it's the promise of eternal life for those who love Jesus, but it also implies something deeper. It speaks of restoration and redemption. It speaks of this intimate relationship with God, a return. It's a return to that image we read in Genesis where Adam and Eve walked with the Lord in the garden, that picture of just like relationship and intimacy. Do not forsake your first love, for in returning to him, And in doing the things we did at first, we find a depth of relationship and a depth of love and a depth of intimacy with our Creator and our Savior that our souls crave and that cannot be found anywhere else. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that this letter that you gave to the Apostle John years and years and years ago to be sent to a a physical church in Ephesus to address things you had concerns about and encourage them in the ways they were doing. I thank you, Lord, that these words ring true to us today, that we can read this and we can see the way in which we are to walk and the mistakes we are to avoid. So God, I pray for two things specifically today, and then I want to give invitation for people to come and know Jesus, but if you're here today and you're like, I, I'm the one who's forgotten my first love. I'm the one who's walked away from that and I've abandoned that and I've maybe I've just, maybe I've just become busy with doing church and doing religion, but I've forgotten to actually love Jesus in the process. Or maybe, you know, you were all about church and Jesus at one point, but you've kind of walked away and abandoned that. If you recognize that you have abandoned your first love and you just want to reignite that passion, reignite that spark of just love and relationship. I just want to pray for you. So God, for those today who say, yeah, it's me, I've, I need to return to my first love. God, I pray that you would, like I just said, just spark something within them. God, that, that passion for you would burn bright, that they would crave relationship, they would crave intimacy, that they would come running back into your arms and begin to just build just an immensely rich and deep relationship with you today. And then for those who are watching, who maybe in in talking today have realized, I'm not sure I ever fell in love with Jesus. I believe in him. I go to church. I do things I'm supposed to do. I I follow what he's asked me to do, but I'm not sure I've ever ever actually fallen in love with him. I I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that feels like. God, I pray for those today that they would just, for for lack of a better term, just fall head over heels in love with you today. That they would just learn to do the things that we do at first when we fall in love with someone. And that they would just, for the first time, experience that rush of emotion, that rush of feeling of, I'm in love with Jesus and he loves me back. And the last thing is this, if you're watching today and and you, you're like, I don't need to return to my first love. And I, I don't know if I need to fall. I guess I, I never met Jesus at all. I guess I need, I need to meet him for the first time. If that's you, I'd love to lead you in a prayer of decision to just follow Jesus for the first time. I'd love to pray with you right now. So I guess if that's you, close your eyes, uh, bow your head, pray along with me. Jesus, I want you today. I want to come into relationship with you. I want what you have for me. I want your love and your mercy and your grace. I want to know you. I want to be loved by you. I want to love you back. I just want to to, to be in relation with you and follow you. 
So Jesus, I, I give you my life today, and I ask you to come in and begin to just speak to me and be with me and, and, and lead me and guide me. Amen. If that's you and you made a first-time decision for Jesus, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, I mean, in fact, if you made any decision today, if you are responding to the words of the message, responding to what God's speaking, we'd love to hear from you. Message the church, call one of the pastors, tell someone who goes here. We, we want to celebrate with you the work that God is doing in your life because he is real and he is with you and he loves you. So that's the end of our service for today. As always, we just want to know, you, we want you to know how much we care for you, how much we love you. If you have any prayer requests, please let us know. If you have any questions about what's going on and want to know how to get involved, please let us know. We are so uh, glad that you were able to connect with us online, and we look forward to uh, continuing to serve you and to seeing you soon. Have a great and blessed week, church.